Star King, here I come. Hello, sports fans, uh, sports collectors, and all hobbyists. Uh, welcome to the Car King Sports and Variety Show. I am your host, the Catman, Brian Catequit, a.k.a. the Car King. We are live on ABC's KMET 1490AM.com, your number one spot right here for news and talk on the West Coast. I thank everyone for tuning in this morning. On the telephone line, I welcome to the program a former NHL right winger who played for the Bruins, Islanders, and Ottawa Senators, I welcome in the versatile Graham Townsend. Graham, thanks for being on. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. My pleasure, Graham. So I figure let's let's begin uh, talking about TownsendHockey.com. Give us a little bit of information about uh, your business and what you do there. Well, yeah, we uh, we operate uh, boarding camps up at up in Maine at the University of Southern Maine in Gorham. We've been operating uh, as a boarding camp for about 15 years now. We've been in the hockey camp business for about 30. And, uh, you know, we kind of focus on specialized camps. Um, we do a lot of year-round mentoring with our with our students, so it's not just coming to camp for a week or two and then, you know, we'll kind of see you next year. We, we keep in touch with our players and we work with them throughout the season, we're doing a lot of video and a lot of in-person visits to see them play and stuff like that. So it's... Um, it's really all about developing good, good character people and um, kind of looking beyond ho- their hockey playing days and helping them navigate this difficult world that we sometimes live in and just becoming really good adults, good, good parents, good friends, good community members, and things like that. That's really, we really focus on that. And, and Graham, uh, do you feel that hockey is still popular in the United States compared to Canada these days? Yeah, I, I think... I think um, yeah, I, don't, I haven't been back back in Toronto or back in Canada for quite a while, but I'll tell you, hockey is exploding down here, and it, you can, it's evident in the in the fact that all these hockey academies are are popping up all over Massachusetts. There was a time where I never thought a hockey based uh, academic um, business would do well here because it just you know Boston in general is sort of the the hub of the, the academic world with all the great universities and stuff like that, you know, with Harvard and, and places like that. And and I never thought that these uh, academies, academies would be able to compete with the prep schools, but they really are. Um, I think there's about four or five now, maybe six actually, in New England. Could even be, could, it might even be ten. I'd have to sit down and think about it. But there's a lot of academies here, and um, they're all doing very well. They're producing a lot of good, good student athletes, and these kids are getting into some really good colleges and and playing some college hockey uh, as well. So it's, it's, it's really taken off. So everyone listening, uh, uh, you know, log into townsendhockey.com and learn more about the program. And you're located in Maine, correct? Yes, that's right. We're, we're in a, we're, we operate out of the University of Southern Maine in a town called Gorham, which is just outside of Portland, about an hour and a half north of Boston. All right, so let's begin your younger years in Canada, uh, where I believe street and pond hockey was the thing to do, right, Graham, to, to fit in with the rest of the kids in the block in the neighborhood? Oh, definitely. Um, I can remember vaguely five, maybe five or six years old, seeing some kids playing this strange game. Of course, I just got from, just moved from, from Jamaica. I think I was about three and a half years old. And, of course, now, you know, you want to play with friends, you want to make friends, you want to meet other kids, and I was a very social kid, so... I, would, I went out and asked them what they were doing. They, they mentioned something about this hockey thing, and I had no idea um, how to play, but I asked if I could, and they said, well, you need you have to have a hockey stick to play. So I just sat there and watched and, you know, sort of p- tried to pick it up. And then a few weeks later, my mom, mom and I were at the grocery store right across the street from where we, where we lived, and there was this garbage can full of hockey sticks. And I remember they were 99 cents. I'll never forget that price. My mom bought me one, and I started playing hockey from there, and I just fell in love with street hockey. And then, of course, that naturally segued into ice hockey. Eventually, once I learned how to skate, and just sort of took off from there. Wow. So what is, now in high school, did, did, you, did you play hockey with their high school team? Well, there, there, was a high, there, was a, there is high school hockey in Canada, but funny enough, I, I grew up in North York, Ontario, which is, again, just a, it's a borough. It was a borough at the time uh, north of Toronto. And in North York, there was no high school hockey, believe it or not. We had every other sport except for hockey. Um, but huh. even, even with that, um, if you were a really serious hockey player and were, were having plans on playing beyond your amateur days, you really didn't play high school because the, 
you, you, you went to these junior leagues where they take all the best players and put them on, you know, different teams and whatnot. You'd be playing against the absolute best of the best uh, versus high school where you might have two or three very good players on your team. And now you're playing with seven or eight good players and it, your, your development just skyrockets. So that's why kids play junior. And then, of course, that's where all the scouts were, and that's where you'd get noticed and then eventually you get offers to play either, either higher-level junior hockey or, or college hockey. And, then, of course, you want to get drafted and then go on to the professional ranks. So that's kind of the route you have to take or you had to take back then to, to get on to the pros. I see, because I'm learning now, because, you know, I'm more of a baseball guy, so, you know, I'm, I'm learning from what you're telling me. Now, I, I see, I'm reading your career, you played for NCAA Division One ECAC Conference, right? Yes, I, I, I played at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, a.k.a. RPI. Uh, at the time, okay. during my recruiting year, it was, was 1984-85 season. They were the number one, number one ranked team in the nation. Uh, actually, they were unknown to me. I had no idea what RPI was. I, being from southern Ontario, the schools we tend to gravitate to were, were like Michigan State, Michigan. We were always, you know, Ohio State. Those are those are the Big Ten conferences, as it's called now. But that's where we were focused. And then all of a sudden, I, I, was a, I ended up being a top recruit my recruiting year. So I heard from a lot of eastern schools, uh, schools in hockey, east and ECAC, and Schools I never even heard of before, but then once I learned what RPI was all about, I was really about academics. I, I, I went to that school because of the academics, and it just so happened to have a great hockey program, which was, for me, the best of both worlds, and that's why I went there. Hmm. And so this was around 87, 88, uh, I'm assuming, and then you, you you made it to team captain, right? You were captain of the team. Um, yeah. My, 87, my 88. Year, I was, yeah, I was voted. Uh, uh, I was a tri captain, so there's three of us. Um, it was my junior year, so that would have been what uh, 85, 87, 87, 88 uh -huh. season. Yeah. Yep. And then, and then you get. Uh, I guess you get drafted by the Boston Bruins, uh, your first team. Now, how did the Bruins hear about you? Well, so I was a free agent. I, I didn't get drafted out of uh, out of junior. So I was, by the time I got into college, I just. I had a really tough freshman year. I, 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 it was, I underperformed. I was terrible. I mean, honestly, I wanted to quit hockey every single day. I, 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 um, I actually quit hockey after my junior year, and it, uh, wow. I had some difficulties with my coach, and so I decided I wasn't going to play anymore. And um, so I told my mentor, who's a, a man named Paul Vincent, out of, he's out of Boston. I, I trained with him every single summer throughout my college days, and I told him I was going to quit and told him why and I just I did not get along with my coach, and uh, it was very difficult. And um, he was hell bent on actually making sure I didn't play professionally. He literally told me that. So I decided, you know, I didn't like playing for him, um, and I, I didn't think that it was it made any sense for me to go through my senior year, um, play hockey and be tortured, and then have no options of playing beyond that. So I wanted to focus on getting my grades up so I could be a chiropractor. That's, that was my goal. So I figured I'd just stop playing hockey and just focus on school. And it just so happened that that summer, Mr. Vincent had a scout from the New Jersey Devils talk to me. And he guaranteed me that if I went back to school and played my senior year, he guaranteed me that somebody would sign me. So I did. I did what he said. I had a very good senior year. So I was a free agent. A bunch of teams, I guess, were calling the coach about me and stuff. And But the coach, the coach wouldn't tell me that uh, teams were interested because he didn't want me to play professionally for whatever reason. I don't know why. So I got an agent. And he took over and then fielded some, some opportunities from other teams. And Boston seemed to be the best opportunity because he, I guess Mike Milbury was the um, head coach in the, the American League team in Maine. And he was going to be the head coach of the Bruins the next year. So the coach of my agent felt if I played well for him, then he might you know favor me and, and bring me up to Boston. And that's exactly what happened. I played well for him. He liked me. And then they, they signed me. And next thing I know, I was playing for the Bruins the next year. Wow, I mean, I said, I mean, that must have been a dream come true. I mean, professional NHL player. I mean, you must have been ecstatic. You know, yeah. People always talk about this surreal feeling, and you know, it really is. Honestly, I, it was it was so weird. I was on the bench for my first game, and um, it was against the Montreal Canadiens, and and the, the anthem, Rennie Rancourt singing the singing the, the anthems, and I'm looking at him, thinking, wait a second, I've seen this guy on TV a thousand times. I'm looking across the ice. I see the Montreal Canadiens lined up on the blue line. I can't believe it's the Montreal Canadiens. I'm, I'm looking at the banners and 
And all of a sudden, I look down at my chest, and I see the spoke be, and I just could not believe that I was in the NHL. And I, I, I honestly had dreamt about this moment for so many, like so many years as a kid. You know, and imagine what it would be like. And here I was, and I, and, I, and for a second, I'm not even kidding. I thought I was dreaming because sometimes I, I have very vivid dreams. They seem so real. So I thought I was dreaming. So I, 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 I bit my tongue. It, it just sounds crazy, but I actually did. I bit my tongue, and it, I felt the pain, of course, and I realized, oh, my God, like, you're not dreaming. This is real. And I looked over at the Canadians <laughs> and go, oh, man, that's the Montreal Canadians. And, you know, you can't be in awe of these guys. They're, they're going to run you over in a second. So I, I snapped out of it and decided that, you know, I got into game mode and got ready to play. But it took a few minutes for me to realize that it was real. So it's just crazy. But it was a great a great experience, and, um, you know, I had, a, I had a good game, and, and sort of things sort of took off from there for me. Yeah, it's like an out of body experience. Now, now, now you got the opportunity to play with uh, one of your idols, I believe, Ray Newfeld, right? I did, I did. <laughs> I was playing. So I, I went up to Maine to, to play for the Maine Mariners, which was the Bruins American League affiliate back then. And um, so I was in the in the dressing room, just putting my gear on for one of my first practices. And Ray Newfeld had just been sent to the minors by the Boston Bruins. I, I of course, I didn't know that, and I'm. Sitting there trying my skates, and all of a sudden, Ray Newfeld walks in, and my jaw dropped. And then I, I kind of—I can still only imagine the look on my face. And he looked over at me, right? And he kind of smirked, he smiled. He knew, you know, that I was in awe of him because of, you know, obviously you know, the, the, the racial, the racial connection, him being a black, a black hockey player, and myself. And I just idolized this guy. And it was really strange because um, I found myself gravitating towards him, sort of unconsciously, and hanging out with him. You know, going everywhere he went. If he was going to lunch, I, I asked if I could come along, and it was just it was just crazy. I was like a little puppy dog following this guy around everywhere. But uh, yeah, he was just someone I really looked up to and still do. And we became really good friends, and we still are. So yeah, it was it was great to have someone that I looked up to as a kid now guiding me through my first year as a professional. Amazing. Now, now, how did you get along with the captain of the team, Ray Bork? Right, he was the captain, I believe. Oh. Ray Ray was incredible. Um, you know, He's a good I, player. I, I mean, great, you, great. You never, there's, there's, you could, you won't find a more unselfish person. Um, he, he, Ray Newfeld, uh, sorry, Ray Bork, rather, and, uh, and Cam Neely, for example, even that Dave Poolin and Craig Janney. These guys were star players on that team, and and they they didn't act like, you know, they were better than anybody else. They they knew that we were all on the same team, and they, they, they made sure that everybody blended in together. Everybody was welcome at different functions and stuff like that, and they went out of your, their way to make you feel comfortable. So I, I was fortunate because I got to experience that type of leadership early in my career, whereas I don't feel I felt that I got that kind of leadership when I was in college. You know what I mean? It was, it, when I was in college, there was a, it seemed like there was a, there were all these different cliques and classes and if you're a junior, you hung up with the junior guys. If you're a senior, and you didn't really blend in with anybody else, but Ray Ray Bork and Cam Neely, they made everybody feel. No matter if you're a superstar, if you were, uh, you know, you could be the stick boy. You were part of the organization. You were part of the team, and and they made sure you understood that and felt that way. They went out of their way to make you feel that way, which was really something I'd never experienced before. So they, so they kind of t- t- took you under the wing. Now, do you remember the time you scored your first goal? I believe it was against Pittsburgh. Yeah, I, I do. It's, you know, it's funny. I mean, it's a great moment for me personally, but unfortunately we lost that game. And, you know, there's this, there's this kid named Jagger who scored his first career hat trick <laughs> that game. <laughs> you know, Yarmir Yager. No, you know, we didn't know yeah, who the yeah. Yager guy was, obviously. right? He was, wasn't Yarmir Yager back then. He was just a rookie he to us. And he, he got his first hat trick that night. So he kinda, I kind of got overshadowed by a future Hall of Famer. And uh, but yeah, it was a great experience. It was again another surreal experience. And, you know, I can't believe I scored uh, a goal in the league, but it was typical Graham Townsend goal, just banging away in front of the net and snapping a rebound and nothing fancy. But you know, that's just how I play and got rewarded for it. But like I said, it, it was bittersweet because we we lost the game, and that wasn't that was not a good feeling, of course. Man, and you know, Graham, I was watching this video on YouTube. Uh, what, what was the deal? I, I, I believe it was February first, nineteen ninety, with Steve Martinson. Did, now, did you and him go at it? Yeah, so that was a game, my first game uh, against the Canadians, and um, so yeah, he and I played against each other in the minors quite a bit. He was in Sherbrooke, where the Canadians had their team back then, 
And uh, we'd never uh-huh. fought, but of course, you know, I'm on the ice, and I turn around, there he is, and he's, he's just looking at me, and he said, let's go. And so, yeah, you, you, you kind of have to, right? So I fought, didn't, <laughs> didn't do great. That fight is, you know, again, broke the number one rule. You know, you fight when you want to, not when someone else dictates. But I felt that I had to do, you know, I had to I had to step up being my first game and being a rookie and all that, but I probably should have waited until I, I was prepared. Wow. So we're talking with Grant Townsend, a former NHL right winger. Now, 91, you joined the Islanders in historic fashion, being the first African-American in Islander history. Uh, what, what were your thoughts on the Islanders, and why, why do you think it took so long you know, for this to happen? Well, I just think that um, there weren't a lot of black players um, playing the game back then, especially when I grew up in Toronto. I mean, there, there might have been two or three black kids in the leagues I played in. Sometimes I was the only one. So there just wasn't a lot of access. And I, th- I think that um, many of us in Toronto, for example, probably most likely came from the Caribbean. And that wasn't a tr- those weren't traditional sports. My dad actually didn't want me to play hockey. He wanted me to play soccer, which I did. And I was much better at soccer than I was at hockey. But, um, but I just fell in love with the game. And my dad, you know, it wasn't like he kind of discouraged me, but he didn't really encourage me to play hockey either. So it's just more more along the lines of what was familiar to, to the people and you know, the people that came from other countries back then. And like I said, many of us came from the Caribbean, so hockey was foreign to us. But now if you go to Toronto, there is a, it's, it's, it's a, a big-time multicultural game. I actually coach a junior team right now, and on our team there's a few kids from Canada. One's, one's a Muslim kid, a kid, an Arab kid from, uh, from, actually from British Columbia. We've got kids that are from all over the world, like different cultures. And, you know, we've got brown and white and everything you can imagine on this team. So hockey now is, is completely different than it was when I was growing up. There are people from everywhere, and it's awesome to, to be able to coach these kids and, and, and you know, to just for them to have a coach who is a person of color and just like they are, even though, even though we're all different shades of the rainbow. But um, it's, it's awesome, man. If you go to Toronto now, you're, you, would never, you would recognize hockey if you grew up there in the 80s. And I just love the fact that now other people are coming from all over the world, from different countries, non-traditional hockey nations, and their kids are now um, picking up this game and they're falling in love with it just the way every other Canadian ever has. It's awesome. Yeah, so so Graham, you really set your mark in the NHL in NHL history because you know not only being the first African American uh, American player for the Islanders, but also the first Jamaican born player to play in the NHL, right? Yeah, it's really weird. I I, I didn't even know that because you know again like all these kids I mentioned, right? They just they're just kids. They you just you pick up a hockey stick, you're playing a game with a bunch of other kids in your neighborhood. So you're just Kids are so innocent. We don't we don't re- realize that we're black, we're brown, we're this or that, right? We just we're just kids. And so I didn't really I didn't even know that I was the first Jamaican-born player in the league until I was actually it was with the Islanders when I discovered it. Um, I was being interviewed uh, in between periods, and, and the, the guy interviewed me. I don't remember his name, unfortunately, but he, he asked. He said, "What was it? What's it like to know you're the first Jamaican-born player in the NHL?" And I didn't know. So I kind of made a joke about it. I said, "Yeah, well, you know, now now I'm not good enough for Team Canada, but I can." I could put Jamaica in the Olympics, and I could be the head coach, the uh, first line center, and the, the stick boy. You know, <laughs> I'm the only one, right? So I just kind of made a joke about it, and uh, and I, I had no no clue that I was the first at all. I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, you're the first. It's in the history books. So I want to ask you. I have a few minutes left. Uh, playing in Boston compared to playing in New York, how's the fan base? You know, you know what? Where's the energy more? I can't, you know, you can't really, can't really say there's more energy here or there because Boston's got its own traditions, and of course, Long Island has its own traditions. And with with, with what the, the team did in the '80s, for sure, is um, and all the great players there. So it's a it's a different vibe. I you can't really pick one over the other. But Long Island was great. I loved playing there. Islander fans were rabid. They were they they, they loved the team, even though we weren't doing well back then. In, 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 you know, compared to how they did what the fans were used to from the '80s and with Al Arbor and everything, but so it was a totally different vibe. And then you go to Boston, and it's just, you know, the tradition of Boston sports. You know, it's just they, they demand excellence in everything you do. Um, you know, if you don't if you don't perform, if you don't try your hardest in New York or Boston, you don't give a hundred percent. You don't want to show your face outside that rink because people pay a lot of money for those tickets, and um, they want to see at least give a hundred percent effort. If you do that, they they're okay. 
Um, they, they want you to win, of course, but if you if you give 100% effort, people respect you in those two cities. So they're both, both very similar. Um, I, I view them both as working class, uh, working class fan base of people that just work hard every day, and they, they want to see their teams work work as hard as they do. And, you know, Grant, for the amateur hockey fans that are listening to the program today and, you know, they're, they're attempting to make it to the uh, NHL, what exactly, what attributes do you need? Like, you need, can you give us a little sense of what does it take to make it to the NHL? Absolutely. You know what? I'm glad you asked that question because I've, I've been reading some, some forms and stuff like that lately of parents and people who, who, who talk about what it takes to be successful in hockey, and I hear a variety of different reasons and different, um, you know, people talk about politics and who you know and all this stuff. And, you know, I don't, I don't chime into any of these, these chat rooms, but I'll tell you what, about 20 years ago I had a falling out with a friend of mine because um, I was coaching a group of kids, and there were some kids that were really struggling, and I was spending, spending a lot of time trying to help the weaker kids in the group. I, I tend to gravitate towards them because those kids remind me of myself when I was a kid. And I just needed extra help, you know what I mean? So I was doing that, and I got criticized by this guy um, because I was spending time with them and not with the elite players. And we had this little bit of a debate, and he said, you know what, uh, Graham, um, I've discovered that a kid either has it or they don't. And if they don't have it, don't waste your time with them. And I got really upset about that. i got to be honest with you, because when people start talking about children that way, I, I, I like project myself onto that child, and I, and I become that kid because I was that kid who... I would have been rejected by this guy back in the day. And so we had this big argument. And so over the past 20 years, I've come to realize that he's right, okay? You either got it or you don't. But it, it's the it that he was wrong about. I think he thought he thinks it is talent. But I believe that it, and this is what I think, this, this is what I believe it, it takes to make it to the NHL or anywhere in life. I teach this to all, all our students. Number one, you have to have character. Right, so if you if you're the type of person, um, if you you know you do the right thing when you think no one's watching. So if you have a coach that gives you an assignment, homework, or whatever, and you go home and you diligently diligently work on it, you've got character. And because if you work on things, you're, you you can't you can't get worse. You're only going to get better. So that's one thing. Then you have to have the, uh, passion and love for the game. Like if you have passion and love for it, you're going to do the work necessary. And the work won't necessarily be considered work. It'll be you know, you you have you find fun and pleasure in your in, in your pain, right? And I think you need those 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 three things. You know, you need character, love, and passion. And that's what I realized when I when I sat there the first time in the, in the Bruins locker room, looking around, and finally it felt for the first time in my life that I was in a room full of people that were just like me. Like we were weird. We were not normal. It's not normal to think that you could play professional sports. Is you, you have to be uh, an outlier, out, thinking outside the box, and not not so much with your talent, because you can grow talent if you have those three things I mentioned: character, passion, and love. And you can make yourself better. And and that's what I I believe that's what it takes. And I don't think there's any other way around it. I didn't have any connections in hockey, obviously, being from Jamaica. I didn't have anybody pulling strings for me at all. Um, I just had to work and work and work to get that opportunity. And once I got it. You know, I, I think I, I feel like I, I made the best of it. Uh, very interesting. And, you know, uh, how about, like, physical ability? I mean, do you know how, you know, you, do you need stick? Obviously, you're going to need stick handling skills. You need to adjust your playing style to different opponents, game situations. That's all instinctive, right? Well, yeah, I think so. I think, I think, I think you have to, you can learn those things. You know, so, so when I was growing up, right, everybody I talked to said, as far as goal scoring, you either have it or you don't. I remember hearing that all the time, okay? So then I then I'd become a Bruin, and it was my first practice. It was, practice was over, and I didn't know if you were allowed to stand on the ice. Access. This is at the guard. I, I had no idea if we were going to be kicked off the ice. Or, so what I did is I didn't want to be the first guy off the ice. I was a rookie. So I went over to the board where the benches were, and I was drinking water, and I was, I was with two other rookies, uh, Shane Stevenson and Wes Walsh, and neither of us knew what to do, okay? So we figured we'd just wait to see what the veterans did, and then we'd just follow them. So we're drinking water, we're looking at the banners, and we're, we're in awe of where we are. And all of a sudden, I look around the ice, and I see in one corner, Ray Bork, world's best defenseman, is doing basic edge drills. I'm talking basic, because I, I, taught, I, I, I was teaching power skating from my freshman year in, in college all the way up to my pros. And I, I saw Ray Bork doing basic power skating drills with all the, all the, all the D-men. 
get all the young guys over in the corner doing doing power skating. Something you never would expect to see a professional do, but he was doing the basic. And then at center and right, all of a sudden, and we're practicing face-offs. Again, basic skills. And then my hero, Cam Neely, was shooting pucks in one, in one other corner. And I remember looking at it, because I was in awe of Cam Neely. And I said out loud, I go, I wonder what Cam's doing. And one of the guys said, what do you think he's doing, dummy? He's, he's working on a shot. And I could tell he wasn't just shooting pucks for the, for the sake of shooting. Like, you could tell it was purpose. It was, it was sick. Yeah. So I went over and asked him, and Cam says, yeah, I'm working on my goal scoring. So here's a 50-goal scorer. He scores 50 goals a year. He's telling me he's working on goal scoring. So that, that taught me you could actually improve that skill. And I started working on my goal scoring, and my goal production went up because of that. So I don't think, I don't think, I think talent can be grown if you work at it. Um, I don't think you have to have talent, but certainly size and some natural, natural attributes do help. But you can overcome those weaknesses if you're willing to work at it. You know, you look at Nathan Gerby, five foot five or five foot three, playing in the NHL, and he's a big star at the time. And you know, Johnny Goudreau, God rest his soul, was not a big guy, and yet there he was, a star in the NHL. So, so if you want it bad enough, you can you can make it happen. And, and Graham, I have like the thirty seconds left, but that, did you cross paths with Wayne Gretzky during your tenure? I, I played against him twice, actually, once in Boston and wow. once in L.A. Yeah, oh yeah, and I, I was in awe of that guy too. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, it must have been amazing just being on the same uh, ice with him. Uh, it, it, what a legendary player, huh? Oh, absolutely. And and that's, I used to just watch him during shift after shift, and the things he could do. And all of a sudden, he take take a nothing play and turn it into a goal scoring opportunity. You just you just, you just couldn't believe like how did he do that? He was just an artist, really. Amazing. Well, listen, I really appreciate your time. Great job this morning. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Take care of yourself. Graham Townsend, uh, first African-American player in New York Islander history. Until next week, happy collecting to all.